good one. I see a solid red. Yeah, so it's a metallic red flow top. Okay, yeah. So, what? What? Uh, let's see, what time is it? I mean, Lawson. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Welcome to another episode of the Caribbean Welcome. Edge. My name is Shauna Whittingham. I'm Keith Herron. I'm Don Wilson. Don from Don and we have a very special guest with us today, Sandra. Hey, 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 hey. All right, so, so happy to have you today. Yes, happy to be here. Welcome, uh, yes. welcome to the Caribbean Edge. So, um, if you want to state your name and the organization um, with who you're with, um, and then we'll dive into things. Okay, so my name is Sandra Sawyer, and I'm the Education and Prevention Manager over at Women in Distress. Okay, glad to have you, glad to have Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, um, we actually have some clo uh, house some cleaning <laughs> items to do before we, we get into tonight's okay. episode. Um, an update for, for the team, and actually for um, our viewers who have watched and followed us. You know we did an episode on immigration, and um, baby Zoe is actually here with my cousin um, Janice because her mother got deported due to the new administration um, guidelines. Um, reinforcements. Yes. Or, or reinforcements, and I should say. How old was the baby, just to reiterate, how old was she? So at the separation? Zoe, at the time of separation, I believe, um, well, you're asking them hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a matter of months, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, she's only, okay. she's only months old. Yeah, it's a matter of months. Right, her mother was deported at least a few months ago. Um, and this is the situation where um, her mother was brought here by her mother at the age of four. So, so she's actually more American than any of us sitting here in front of you right now. And um, she got deported. So the latest is a week ago, she got her ID finally because yes. remember she wasn't even documented in Honduras. Right. So they have her in a safe um, place in Honduras, usually where the tourists and the expats are. And so she's there. She got her ID a week ago. She went for an interview and um, she took some tests. So she's waiting to hear if she gets the okay. job. Things are looking up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 TC Heat. Heat. Helping out again. You know, doing our thing, trying to see what we can have done, and I don't know if anybody out, uh, you know, when our viewers had anything to do with that, you know, and getting the word out also. But thank you for who had any part in getting this move forward quick. As well as any contributions, whether financially, emotionally, um, that we've we've yeah. been able to provide to baby Zoe and her mother and to um, Janice. So, um, what else? What 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 go on in the news? I'm oh. still waiting to find out who's my governor. Oh, the recount. Yeah, the recount. Yeah, yeah. 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 governor and senator. We have to see how that's going. Yeah. Um, I think once again, Florida is a laughing stock of the United States. Mm. We can't seem to get it right. But here's what: the silly season for the midterms. Uh, we have two more years, and then there'll be the major silly season coming up. So we have to get this right. The good yes. news is for Florida, I'm not sure I want to call us the laughing stock because I live here and yeah. I love Florida. Me too. But I, I think it's great that we, the systems are in place to enforce the recounts regardless of the outcome. There is a process which is being followed to make sure the true winner comes out. Yeah. So I appreciate that. It's right. true. We just had um, Veterans Day, so big up to all the veterans all who, keep, that, yeah. um, who allow us to just be free and have this freedom of speech, which definitely, is part of definitely. what the Caribbean Edge is about. Yeah. The freedom to vote, the freedom to at least not be scared for the most part when you leave your home and for your children. So Absolutely. thank you all the veterans that have sacrificed and to their families that also make the sacrifice. And Unfortunately, there is news and, and, and about veterans not be, being treated cor um, properly, getting the necessary health care, funding, attention. So, you know, the numbers are really high, like 29 suicide deaths you, per year. So definitely thank you for everyone that makes the sacrifice for us. You know what, uh, we need to do a show on that and actually yeah. invite a, a vet on and talk about that. It's funny, that dude, I forgot his name, but he's from um, Westworld. He has something on HBO special. Oh, the show, Westworld. We're not done 
we're not done yet. It's called. And what it has to deal with is veterans that come back and they're just thrown, they're just casted away yeah. by the government. Okay, you've done your job. Okay, go on. Uh, but I have P PTSD, you know, I need medical help and so forth. And they are just out there by themselves. Yeah. So that uh, documentary is basically on how the job is not done yet. These guys are, were, they gave to the country and the country needs to give back to them. Yeah, so absolutely. As a country, we have a lot of work to do uh -huh. as far as um, therapy, rehabilitation, and whatnot. Whether it's in the prisons or with vets, we have a lot of work yeah, to do. Absolutely. So maybe we could do a show on that. We should, we yeah. should. And last but not least, these horrific fires in California. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some number, I the, yeah, the death that's 34 or, deaths. Yeah. As of this morning, right. the numbers have probably gone up. and, and uh, Hundreds of people time. missing. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we expect the numbers 34. to go up. 44. 44. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people have lost their homes. Our hearts definitely go out to you and your families during this time. Safety is number one key. So I think getting out, evacuating if you're threatened is the safest thing to do. I don't know the circumstances, but definitely heartfelt. Right, right, right. So um, on that note, moving on, Sandra, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have you. So you are with Women in Distress. That's correct. So what, um, before we get into the organization, tell us a little bit about yourself as far as how you're connected with this organization and what your job function, what your role um, and responsibilities are. Okay, I'm the education and prevention manager at Women in Distress, and what that means is I really go out into the community to spread awareness. I do trainings. Uh, a portion of my department, we go out to the high schools and middle schools. We talk to the young adults about healthy relationships. Middle school? Yes, as young as middle school, absolutely. So as young as middle school, they feel like they're already dating, they're already in serious relationships. So as hard as that is to hear, that is the truth of it. Yeah, that is. Sandra, so, yeah. I want to um, apologize ahead of time if they say my eye pop off. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so let's yes. go ahead. So our young kids are dating younger and younger. And so unfortunately, they're also, when they're dating, they're also experiencing that teen dating violence. Because yeah. they're vulnerable. vulnerable. Yeah. Yes, they're vulnerable. And they, they don't fully understand what a healthy relationship even is, mm -hmm. you know. So of course we're out there trying to do that preventative piece, going out there talking to them about what are healthy relationships, you know, what are your boundaries, how do you express your boundaries to somebody, you know, how do you tell someone you're not comfortable with something, yeah. um, and kind of understanding what that healthy relationship would look like. Especially, especially, especially at that impress impressionable age of where course. these girls are might even like, you know, they might not like something or appreciate something, but they don't want to say anything because they don't want this person to not like them. Exactly. Like, that's another level. They're definitely yeah. at that age where they care a lot about what their friends think. They're not telling their parents, of course, because can your 12-year-old come to you and say, hey, you know, little Jimmy yeah. is hitting me. You mean my boyfriend? And you'll be like, what do you mean your boyfriend? Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to have one. So they're not talking to their parents. Yeah. So guess who they're talking to? Talk to no one or their friends. Their right. friends. Yeah. The other 12-year-olds right. that right. can't give any good advice yeah. in the first place. They're just so, as ignorant. I know some that are just kids. I don't know any that. <laughs> I was surprised. Like I, I took my daughter to do her physical when she was in middle school, and her doc, her doctor is a Caribbean doctor, so she was very thorough. Not that other doctors aren't, but she specifically was, and she started talking to her about these things about you know relationships. And my daughter was like, what are you talking about? And I had to say to her, listen, your friends are dating. Because it doesn't seem real even to some of the kids because their mindset isn't there. So I can't imagine for the young girls that are getting involved in relationship at that age when you don't even, un to me, you don't even understand who you are as a person. That's significant because if you can go out and speak to them at such a young age, even if they're not being abused, at some point in their life, they may find themselves in that situation and they may reflect back on your conversation with them. It's a can we put a number to it though? How, what's the youngest that, you, that you, you've, um, you've had to uh, speak Like with? I said, as young as 12. As young as 12? As young as 12, yes. Wow. Has anyone admitted to being abused? Oh yes, absolutely. It's very high. It's very high. With teens, it's one out of four teens. Wow. Well, one out of four. Yes. Wow. One out of Keeping four. in mind that 12 is not a teen yet. Exactly. Yeah. That's a wow. tween. Okay. 
Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Women in Distress, the organization. Okay, so Women in Distress was founded in 1974. It's a nationally accredited um, full service center. So when I say full service center, that means that we provide shelter, emergency shelter. So if something happens and a woman is ready to leave and escape, then we're able to provide that shelter for them. Um, we provide outreach services because um, some people are not ready to leave. But some people, we know how complicated it is to really leave a domestic violence relationship. So we provide outreach services, which might be um, individual counseling, group counseling, therapy, um, we have our education and prevention department, my department, going out there spreading awareness. We have our economic empowerment program because we're finding that over 90% of people that are in a domestic violence relationship are also in an economic abusive relationship. Yeah. Yes. So um, we just recently opened up a pet shelter last month because they found that many people would not leave their abusers because mm -hmm. there was a pet yes. at home. And the abuser would try to kill the pet. And there's sign. no shelters that accommodate to wow. that's good that you're changing that and a pet. With so time. we're changing with it and wow. now we're really proud to know that yes, we actually have a pet shelter next to our shelter. Cool. Yeah. So you guys, I want to interject here because we actually did a past episode on abuse abuse, remember? And that was one of the signs if the abuser threatened or killed the pet. Do you, yeah. do you guys yeah. remember? Yeah. 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 But I find that really good because you're you're listening to the reasons the the, the reservations mm -hmm. people are having and you're changing your business structure mm -hmm. to accommodate if well, we could take away as many awesome. boundaries as possible yeah. or barriers as possible to get them in a safe place that's what we're really trying to do so yeah but that's why I say full service okay. with, with the advent of increased awareness I'm assuming we're having increased awareness mm -hmm. as the years go on are you seeing um, a more propensity for, for a woman to come out and um, I let it be known that they are, they are in an abusive relationship? Because I know they're apprehensive yeah. for the most part before, so the numbers were skewed. Yeah, and sometimes they're ashamed. They feel ashamed. Right. You know, they kind of feel like embarrassed. A lot of times people see like the abusive women as a woman that's weak, low mm -hmm. self-esteem. But from my time being at the shelter, they're not. They look like us. You know, mm -hmm. um, the men look like you all. Yeah. So therefore, yes. All right. So <laughs> hold on. I mean, like really, just all right. Like, I know some of you people out there, like probably you hear the record scratch at the same time I did. What do you mean, men? So men are so, being yes, men are being abused. One out of nine men in the U.S. are experiencing little known facts. Yes, and yeah. that's what's reported. So the numbers that's just reported. Right. Exactly. Right. 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 So there comes with a bigger shame with men, right? Obviously. Because with men, you're like, wait a minute, how can a man be abused? He's stronger. He's bigger. But it's happening, and it's not just physical abuse. There's other types of abuse that's uh, going on. So they could be verbal abuse, emotional abuse, again, economic abuse. Right. So um, men are being affected as well. Um, when we think about our LGBTQ community, oh, right, there right, are right. you know men with men and women with women. So therefore, you know that's another high number as well. And a lot of times, people are not willing to come out in that community to talk about the abuse. Mm -hmm because sometimes their family doesn't even know their sexual orientation. Wow, yeah. So the abuser will try to blackmail them and say, you yeah. know what, if you call the cops, I'm gonna let everybody know oh, yeah. your sexual orientation. Yeah. So they stay with the abuser. So you have two, two, you have two two avenues of trauma now. Yes, yes. Yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Rotten, oh. can I say rotten? Yes, yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so no just to say. take a, a couple minutes and thank everyone for joining us. Please know that this is the opportunity to ask questions. If you're being abused, if you have a friend that's being abused, just put it in the chat. We'll present it to Sandra and, and get you some answers. And I don't need to call no name. And there will be yeah. later on in the segment of this episode, we, we really want to spend some time and place some emphasis on, um, we can dive into the science to look for, but we want to dive into the resources that are available and how you can spot the signs and be of pro, um, you just productive assistance. So, so uh, Sandra. <laughs> so uh, before we move on about um, like the signs, of, what else about women in distress um, would you like to share with us or with the audience? Well, I think there's so much. Like I said, the shelter. We have a thrift store also that I'd like to talk about. Our thrift store is located in Margate. Um, the reason I find the thrift store really important is because 
um, let's say there's a woman and she leaves her abusive husband in the middle of the night. She has four children with her. Of course, most of the time they try to leave with just what they have on them. Um, when they get to our shelter, they have no clothes. So they are provided a voucher from the thrift store so that they can go get clothes. That's awesome. That's, that's you know, do you know how many times, in, 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 I mean, my wife can tell you how many times we're at home and we're like, okay, so mm -hmm. we're going to go to food, we're going to drop off these. Because, you know, you start to afford clothes after a while, mm -hmm. you know? So, and we always either send them abroad or we go drop them off at Goodwill Salvation Army. That's a good outlet. Oh, yes. yes. Now I, I make sure I send all my stuff to Women in Distress because I oh. know I've seen where it's going to use. And of course, everyday people can go and shop at the thrift store as, as well. Yes. But at least we know the revenue's going back into the world, right. going back to the participants that come in. That's so awesome. yeah. when someone wants to donate to the Margate location, they will go to that location. Is it a tax write-off just similar Absolutely. to others? So, so that's we'll important for our viewers. Yes. You're not losing anything. You can still write that you off. Still write it off. Your taxes. They take furniture. They take, especially a high need for baby items. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of children. Most of the time, um, I think over 50% of our participants have children under the age of 12. Yeah, so we're always looking for baby items, children items. Yes. And if they want to donate financially, Yes, financially, if you want to di donate financially, there is a development department that would deal with that, so it just depends on how large the donation is. Okay. And we'll definitely provide you all the contact information, the toll-free number, the address to the Margate location yes. as well. So so let's dive into like the signs to look for. Which we were talking and I was sharing with you, I was in the supermarket the other day and there was a, a, a young man and a young lady and the young man's posture and body language screamed hostility. And the woman that was with him looked scared. And immediately in my mind, you remember TCE, we went, we had done an episode on human trafficking. Mm -hmm. My brain immediately went to, is this woman being trafficked? And so, I mean, I wasn't following them around the supermarket or anything. We're but talking. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, no. But I kept running into them and I kept searching the woman's eyes to see if she would even look at me. And she wouldn't even look at me. And then, you know, you don't want to overstep your boundaries, you know. What, what do you say? What do you do? And in the end, I felt like a failure because I didn't do anything. I was just trying to tell, send this woman a telepathic message like to look at me. I didn't know how I would tell her, like blink two times if you need help <laughs> or, or something or lower her to the bathroom some way, somehow. But could you share with us? But, Sandra, before you answer that, let mm -hmm. me add to that because I think your answer would, uh, would actually answer this question also. Okay. I had an incident that as a younger, a much younger man where I got involved. I saw a friend of mine, a girlfriend of mine that was being um, roughed up by a boyfriend. Right, it was get it was getting violent, and I got involved. I'm like, you all right? What was going on? And she's the one who told me, no, no, just go back. And she sh shrugged me off. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I, you know, I'm young. I'm I'm not really used to seeing that kind of um, that kind of situation. I don't know how to address it, so I backed off. Mm -hmm. Now, what should I have done? Could I have handled it better? Maybe you can answer that along. You know, in that. So situation. I'm gonna tell you both, as crazy as this sounds, you both handled it exactly right right yeah, okay. yeah that sounds crazy right because you did nothing <laughs> and, I, and, I, and i'll tell you why sometimes doing nothing is best um, one time i did a training and i go out to different agencies and i do these trainings and um at the end of my training this young man raised his hand and he said you know what i have something to say and i know a lot of women are not going to be happy with it but i think some women like getting beaten so all the women in the room, you know, we all gave him that. Like, well, how can you just say something like that? And he explained the same, similar situation. He was trying to help out. He saw a man abusing this woman in the street, slapping her, hitting her. He goes in. So he jumps in and starts to fight the, the other man. They get into an altercation. They're fighting. The woman jumps in and starts beating him up as well. So he's really upset because he's like, how is it I tried to come to her aid and she started fighting me? So my answer is this. It's survival. At the end of the day, she she's not going home with you and she's not going home with you. She has to go home to that matter. Yeah. And you don't know how much worse it's going to be now that she gets home. So she could turn, the, the batterer could turn and say, 
Did you know that guy? It's her fault. Right? Are you sleeping with him? Oh yeah. my. Yeah. Why did he come right. help you? Right. Why did you not come to my aid? And all of a sudden, she has a worse night than when it started. Right. right. So we have to be very careful sometimes not to necessarily intervene with that. Now, when there's actual abuse happening with your situation, you didn't get you didn't get to see anything. You realized, okay, something happened, but you didn't see any like physical abuse. No. If you see physical abuse, I always say, get on your phones, call 911. Call somebody to help. Mm-hmm. Don't just stand there, definitely not. But um, don't go in and try to be a hero either because sometimes you can actually put the person in more danger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, this is more on the personal side for you. Where are you actually from and how did you get involved in this? Okay, well I'm a social worker. I've been a social worker for over 20 years, a trainer for about 15 years. Um, I come from a Caribbean background as well. Both of my parents are Haitian. I come from a Caribbean background, and from doing social work over the years, I never wanted to deal with domestic violence. I used to work for the Department of Children and Families, and I had a few cases of domestic violence, and I never liked it because working with the um, survivors was very difficult because they always kept going back, and I had a hard time understanding that. So I kind of felt like I don't want to work with this population. So, um, but I tell people all the time, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And so here I am, right? <laughs> so I'm here and I realize I'm back here, but it makes sense because now I understand it a little bit better. You know, back then I wish I had the tools and the knowledge that I have now, but now I understand it a lot better because there's so many reasons why it's difficult for them to leave. Um, I'm happy I've never been in that situation. I've never um, experienced any kind of violence, but I've seen it around me. And you'll be surprised on how many people around you are going through it. One out of three women in the US, one out of three, right? There's three of us here, right? Um, One out of four teens, one out of nine men. There's a lot of people experiencing it. And let's let's just delve into that because there is no particular look no. There is no particular financial status. You no. could reach Satil. Mm-hmm. You could still be experiencing experiencing it. Education. No, it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, and, um, and, and oftentimes in our last episode that we did, I think, Sean, you talked about this. Um, we didn't call it um, abuse. We called it intimate. Intimate violence. Um, uh, intimate violence. Violence. Right, because it's usually the person closest to yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And then can we talk about the children? So children, of course, we know that children that, we know violence is a learned behavior, right? So children that experience violence in the home are twice as likely to either become an abuser or a victim. Mm -hmm. The abuser. Yeah, they either abuse or they get hurt, exactly. So we know that, and of course, you know, there are some effects that happen with children that are seeing violence in the home. They're more likely to have aggressive behavior at school, um, bedwetting, nightmares, antisocial, you know, so all these things are happening which are gonna affect their education. And there is this sort of like PTSD and stress trauma. That yes, happens. well, that's what, let's say little Johnny grows up now. Little yeah. Johnny was going through this when he was young. So now little Johnny's older, mm-hmm. Now he can experience post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, suicide. Yeah. So these are all the long-term effects. Too many triggers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So if if I'm an abused woman mm-hmm. and I call women in distress, walk me through what I should expect for our viewers and all of us. Here. Well, it's not really a cookie cutter type of thing. It's going to accommodate to your situation and what you're going through. But there are people that will answer. There's a hotline. So right. the hotline is an expert on the other end. And they go about it. I'm not, I'm not even really sure of this whole process because they don't really tell me all of that process. But I do know that they will talk to you and find out what is it that you need. Right. And it's all confidential. Of course. Yes, yes definitely. they got to find out what you need. Um, the biggest thing is that we don't tell people just leave. I always say don't ever tell somebody, why don't you just leave? That's the worst thing you can tell somebody. Because again, you're victim blaming. Right. You're blaming right. them as if you're in the wrong, how come you just don't make your life better and leave? Right. Okay. Secondly, you're just another person telling them what to do. Right? The right. batter is already doing that. So the best thing you can ask them is, how do you want me to help you? So that's what they'll really ask you because yeah. you might not be ready to go. Right? Yeah. Right? right? You live in a beautiful house, right? You depend on your husband financially, you might have a medical issue. 
and you depend on that insurance. So you're not ready to walk out that door right, right. now. Right. So if you're not ready to leave, they may say, okay, let's think of a safety plan. Right. Okay, maybe take some important documents, take your kids' birth certificates, take your birth certificates, start saving money, put some money aside, leave it at a neighbor's house that you can trust. So they might do that with you. Or they might say, if you're ready to come in, then they'll see how they can place you in the shelter and what oh, other resources yeah. you might need. So let me ask you this question because I don't know if it was a definite question directly, directly to you. Um, what does it look like? When, how do I know as I walk by? I mean, we're insinuating. We have two, two um, ex, uh, examples of what uh, Sean and Shauna went through. And it was a presumption that that was the case. Um, but no, just Sean no knows definite. She didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, he was not handling her. Yeah. All right. But, yeah, yeah. but you mean, yeah. you, you, what are the signs? I mean, right. Is there any training yeah. or something that we can see? Well, definitely the there are signs. The biggest two things are power and control mm-hmm. in domestic violence. It's okay. one person trying to have power and control over the other person. Um, if you're with somebody or you see a couple that where the person is constantly humiliating, the other person. That's a big red flag. Now we do it in joke, you know. My husband, yeah, yeah right. My husband comes out. I don't like that shirt. It's ugly. I can joke around. Are we with rough it. in other community? The right, Caribbean right. community. The Caribbean, rough. The Caribbean rough. community can be very <laughs> rough. rough. So it can be very difficult to kind of see that, right? Because there's a thin line, right? Yeah. But I think there is a point where if I can joke with my husband and I laugh and he laughs back, but if you're seeing where it's just more of a joke on one side and the other person is really feeling embarrassed, hurt, humiliated, that's a red flag. Now, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily happening. It's a red flag, right? Um, If the person isolates you from friends and family, they don't want you around your friends and family. And why do you think they wouldn't want you around? They don't want those friends and family to influence or even pick up the, pick up, they, because when you're outside looking in, you can see things more clearly than when you're right, right up under. In fact, and your family's always going to tell you, right? You're going to have one family member be like, oh, that's not normal. Yeah, but they control you too yes. in that way by isolating you. Of course. Is it quite because common? if I move you away, you depend on me yeah. more, right? Yeah. Is it quite common that the abuser does not see this for a while? Does not I see mean, the, 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 the abusee, oh. the person being abused. Yeah, sometimes the, the they, victim, don't, right. they don't see it. I mean, think about it. How many times we were all in relationships we had no business being in, right? Yeah. I'm the only one who's in it. So you try to see the good in the person, right? right? No matter if you know oh, something's not right, but you keep trying thinking you see yeah. the good. Yeah. Um, a lot of times the survivor, I mean, it doesn't happen in the first date. You know, you don't go out on a first date and the guy says, I don't want you to see your mother anymore or your sisters because you'll never date them again. Right. It's gotten to the point where the person's gotten comfortable and they're relaxed and you're in a relationship and you start to feel like, okay, I'm comfortable, I like this. And they, that's when you'll start to see a lot of that power and control. Happening. It's very calculated. Yes, it is yeah. very. It's calculated and it's very much intentional. I, I like the fact that you brought up um, about you, you definitely do not tell anyone that calls in why don't you just leave mm-hmm. and i think it's important because that's the if, if family's getting involved and family sees it and just speaking from a personal um from a personal perspective that would probably be the first thing i'm gonna say you know listen if it's my sister my cousin um or a close family friend i'm looking at it and I say, why don't you just leave yeah. we're here just leave and that's not what you know that's that's not the best thing to say at the time but i, I also want to get back to what you said um about the uh Somebody mentioned that there's some women who like it, mm-hmm. and everyone was like, "How oh, can you say such a thing?" But I happen to know that there are certain cultures where that is a sign of the man asserting himself. A lot of it, has, it well, without casting aspersions on certain cultures, this is there, a lot of it happens in Muslim cultures, mm-hmm. right? That's not the truth for all Muslims, but there's some Muslim cultures that are like that, right? And another side to that is in Christian culture, right? They don't want to leave because that means they're gonna break up a family mm-hmm. and that doesn't bode well for scripture because it doesn't does believe in no that God doesn't want divorce. Mm-hmm. You must fight for your family and go through the pain, walk over hot rocks and all that. You know, so my question to you is is is, is there is, do you find that a lot is that a common denominator in a lot of the women that come in? Mm-hmm. So there's two things, points that I wanna jump on. First one is of course religion plays a big part. 
So that is a lot, that is, that's a big factor on where people stay, religion and culture. Mm -hmm. it, it plays a big part. So when you're trying to be culturally competent, you know, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to kind of see what is culture and what is, you know, abuse. Yeah. Um, secondly, the main thing, like I said, it's power and control. So let's say you have a couple and it's a Muslim couple. Let's use that example. Um, and the woman stays home. She takes care of the children. She doesn't know anything about finances, about the bills. Um, the husband is the breadwinner, right? I've had people come to me and be like, yes, I know that she's very quiet. Um, he makes all the decisions. I'm kind of concerned that she might be going through a domestic violence situation. This is what I say. Did you have a conversation with her? Because if that is their culture, and she agreed on it, and he agreed on it, Nobody has more power or control over anybody, yeah. even if the, the man is the breadwinner. You may not like it. You may not like it. it. That's not your culture, yeah. but they're okay. That's their culture, yeah. and she's fine. Yeah. You know, she may not even, she might be looking at us women like, you go to work. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you know what I mean? So we have to be very culturally mindful. sensitive and yeah. mindful that mm -hmm. we just don't jump to conclusions when we see this because that is their culture and you know we have to respect that yeah. and I say if there isn't any abuse apparent abuse that you're seeing then you know they're fine it's one person having power and control over the right. other person so so in what I'm hearing you say just to summarize if, if there if we don't see anybody trying to control another person mm -hmm. stay out of the people in business yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> or it could have been already agreed right, right. sometimes Sometimes it looks like it's a control situation, but he agreed on it, she agreed on it, and this is how they're moving right. forward, you know? So. Well, one time I was in Chicago and I was checking into a hotel. It was a very eccentric type of um, environment, and out of a car came one person holding somebody else on a dog leash. I think it was agreed upon. Yeah, that's what was agreed upon. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So, it's like, okay. Once again, we want to thank the viewers and Cheryl Johnson for commenting. Very good information. So thank you so much. Love the group and how you're trying thank to you, educate and inspire in a lot of different years. Thank you for the positive vibes. Um, I do have a question for you. Like me personally, grew up in a household where my dad was an abuser, very um, abusive to women and also to us as his children, beyond anything I, I can explain. Um, because it de definitely people that know me now as an individual would never think that I went through having an abusive dad. So I set certain standards for myself never to be in a relationship where someone could abuse me. So from my dad's abuse, I learned how I did not want to be treated. And it's heartfelt to know that either children are watching the abuse as they're growing up or become abused themselves and also turn that. So it's this, this pattern that continues the cycle and especially in the Caribbean community, they, it, it, it's they, so hidden. Like my, half of my family, or probably all my family, most of them would disagree in me publicly speaking about it, but I think it's such an important message. So we definitely can't thank you enough for, for being here and to share it with us. But for women that are being abused or children that are being abused, how do you think we can continue to get that message across? Because some of these women end up dying Absolutely. Um, because they've stayed in these situations. I'm so, sure you've seen it, heard it, oh, felt yeah. it. I said with culture, again, going back to culture, especially with the Caribbean mm -hmm. um, community, um, a lot of times it's very much seen as a norm, right? Um, spanking your child is a norm for a lot of Caribbean people. I grew up, my grandmother used to hit me and beat that's just the way it was and I started to see that as very much normal even as I became a parent I know I didn't want it to be excessive as I may have experienced but it wasn't especially even as a social worker it was conflict for me because right. I was like what do you mean you don't discipline you know and mm -hmm. then working at DCF 
sometimes in parents with discipline, it was seen as, okay, you have to pull the child. And I'm like, no, they're just disciplining. So I struggled with that for a long time. Just on a side note, we did an episode on do you to spank or not to spank. And we've determined <laughs> that the four of us need therapy. But <laughs> so I might be the fifth one, right? I just don't know it. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it is kind of a thing that we start to see as that's regular. Or when a child acts up, we look and say, oh, what does this parent do yeah. something, right? So culture is big. It's a big thing. I think that's going to be an ongoing thing with the Caribbean community until they start having more conversations about this. Like, I think that we can change that. We can shift that. Mm -hmm. Our generation can definitely shift that. Sometimes when you know better, you do better, right? Yeah. So I think with the older you know, groups and things like that, sometimes I think now they look back, and my grandmother would tell me she's wrong. She was wrong. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That is so awesome. She would say yeah. she was wrong. She could have, or with my daughter, forget it. You know, yeah. when they get older, they're so much like, no, don't hit her, don't do this, don't do. But because she realized that wasn't the way. There was better ways. But right. sometimes they just didn't know. They're so, going based yeah. on how they were raised. So when you hear them say that, you don't look around like. Absolutely. Right, yes. right, right. Where was the, where was the last one? I'm like, no, no, no. like now you say it, yeah, but You're late with that. Yeah. <laughs> and my dad was the opposite. When he got older and I got older and I was able to speak to him, he he said, You don't want to know what I went through, which was the wrong answer. So yeah. he continued the cycle so, with his parents. Yeah. I never beat my kids. Mm -hmm. And then my cousins found that very, you know, they're like, oh no, Don doesn't spank her kids. And I said, because I really don't have a reason to spank them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just didn't feel that they did anything that was worth it. And they're perfectly fine. And we'll find that a lot, because we'll see people either twice as likely to abuse or become a, um, yeah. a victim, or they do completely opposite. opposite. They're like on the other end of the spectrum where they're like, yeah. no, I'm that, that was me. I decided to stop yeah. certain cycles in my family. It's it stopped right here. Like my my children don't even know. Like I I can just I have a wicked look though. I can get them a look <laughs> and, and they will cry. There you go. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, Sean. Do you, do you see a corollary between? We, we know the whole spanking thing, and the first people to jump up and say, "What?" Just two, just one belt, and everything's done. And that normally comes from either whether it's Caribbean communities or um, Latin communities or the black community, um, completely, right? And that's because that's how most of us tend to have been raised. Now, do you see a correlation between that and the woman coming into the center or, or seeking help? Like, in other words, what are what are the numbers? Of the, the kind of people that are coming into women at this I wish I had the numbers that I don't have. I know we have 132 beds and they're full most of the time. Wow. I know that um, most of the time they will tell you that they grew up in a family where they did see abuse. You know? Okay. So there, definitely there is that cycle that keeps going on. Um, we're hoping that we stop it with the kids by the time that they get there. But for the most part, um, yeah, I don't have the numbers of how many, but the truth of the matter is we definitely see the cycle continuing to happen. All right. And I, I have another question for you because I never really thought about the processes of exactly what goes on. So, if you could maybe enlighten me on, on a person comes in, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, you know, they were trying to deal with their, their situation as you're trying to help them, but they decided this is the time I have to come in. What are the processes that you do have for them now to recapture their life, their confidence, and go on and be um, a part of society? Okay, so like I said, it's a full service center, so there is a lot of services that's provided there. Um, we, if they go into the shelter, of course they're getting fed, food, medical care. So we cover all of that. Medical as well? Medical care as well, absolutely. We cover all of that. Um, we do provide the vouchers. We try to see if we make sure, if they don't have transportation, we try to see if we can get them transportation to um, work and school. Especially, you know, relocating the children, because a lot of times the baron knows where the children go to school, so that becomes a whole, you gotta remember, that's like taking your life and turning Turn it, it completely upside down. Upside down. Yeah. You know, I tell people all the time, I love my bed, even after a vacation. I love coming home <laughs> to my own bed. And so for somebody to take that away from me and yeah. I can't go and I have to go to a shelter with other people, that's a Devastating. Tough, Mentally, that's a, emotionally, yes. psychologically. That's a level, tough thing yeah. to do. Yeah. So once they get there, 
they are assigned an advocate, which is like a case manager, counselor, right. and they make sure they go with them. And like I said, it's not cookie cutter based on their needs. So somebody might come in and just need, she just escaped, and she might just need to get to North Carolina where her mother lives. Oh, okay. You see? And you would aid her in We would aid her in getting there. Yeah. That's more of a quick process. As we know, Broward County housing for Broward County, very difficult to find. So most of the time it's a housing issue. 57% of homelessness is attributed toward domestic violence. Wow. I, yeah. How much? What's the percentage? Fifty-seven percent, more wow. than half. So I always thought people who were homeless, it was you lost your job, you're drinking, you're doing the wrong thing. No, more than half has to do with domestic violence. So, well, I'm, I'm sorry, were you, were you done? No. Yeah. So that once they're in, we're still trying to find them housing, which is difficult, and how helping them get back on their feet. For some women that might be experiencing economic abuse, we help them find jobs. You know, we help them maybe go back to school and get a degree. We provide the therapy, the counseling. So there's a lot of services. It just depends on where they're at and what they need. Right. Right. Awesome. Be yeah, because I figure um, because of the dominance of the person who is uh, abusing and they abuse uh, the, the victim himself, being you now a person who is probably going to have massive trust issues, oh, yeah. um, do they still stay in touch with you and you normally make it a part of duty that when they're out on their own, so to speak, and trying to get back into rental life, they can check up on them every once in a while. That's the outreach or, center. Okay. So the outreach department, even after you leave shelter, you can still come and get services. Right. You can still but what about those them. who think they have it down? And um, do you still reach out to them? Or do you, uh, or, or is it better for them to reach to you? They have to reach to us. Oh, think yeah, about right. it. If they're still with an abuser and we're calling yeah, from domestic violence problem. shelter, yeah. we're causing more problems. Right, right. So most of the time, we don't really reach out. Unfortunately, the sad thing I've seen since being there is we don't know what happens. You know, right. sometimes sometimes they get up from shelter and leave. And they could have went back to the batterer. And right. we, don't we don't know. know. We don't you know, know what happens. You don't know if the situation got better or worse. worse. But Sandra, yeah. I want to actually, um, we have about 15, 10 or 15 but, minutes left. I want to. Uh, just. Just before you go into the next segment, I just wanted to ask if you could expound on that a, a tad more on the 57% um, statistic that you just quoted. 57% of the homeless are as a result of domestic abuse. Now, is that because they are no um, financially um, they, they are done because they have left their partner, or is it because they are escaping the partner? Both. Both. Okay. Now that it becomes a situation where maybe if you take a single, well now a single mom who really doesn't have a lot of skills, maybe never went to school, and now she's on her own. Yeah. Of course it's harder for her to get a job and find somewhere. Or if it's the stay-at-home mom who maybe lives you know, in a beautiful home, mm -hmm. but now she has to escape and leave and she has no you know, know access to this money but she knows I have to leave, you know? It's shocking to me, 57%. So, yeah, That's so shocking. that actually segues directly into what I wanted to talk about, which is, is before it gets to this level, what kind of advice can we give to little girls, little boys, to, um, you know, I, I really like that you have an economic segment, teaching people how to become financially stable um, you know, if I had to just, as a, as a regular person, think about it, I would think, you know, that, that education, that, that becoming a depend, in, independent, rather, um, and, and yes, learning to pay bills, learning to understand just certain fundamentals about surviving so that nobody can come and control you, whether it's agreed upon or not, that if push come to shove, if you even want to be a stay-at-home mom and take care of the kid, kids, should something happen, forget this person abusing you. How about if this person dies? You know, how, what kind of life would it be if you don't understand the basics? So can, I kind of want to dial it back. I have young children. We all have young children. What kind of advice would you give to just even prevent or try to circumvent this um, nature of affairs? Okay, so the financial aspect is definitely a big aspect. Um, but what we do see is even with very affluent people, it still happens, right? Right. Domestic violence has no socioeconomic status that it goes to. So it still happens. 
of course, yes, you're, it's easier for you to get up and say, I'm going to leave, right? Yeah. If you have some money and somewhere else to go, definitely. But I would think when I talk to my daughter, my daughter's 19, her biggest thing for me when I'm talking to her is respect, number one. Knowing what that looks like. You know, for a long time, we told our little girls that if the boy pulls their hair or bothers them, he just likes you. No. Right? Mm. Yeah. But for a long time, that was, that was a pattern for a long time. I never said it, but it was a pattern for a long time. Um, I think a lot of times with domestic violence, what we see in media or what we see around, it's almost, it's very much glamorized to abuse women. Violence to women is very much glamorized. And I'm saying that because I know, yes, men do get abused, but of course the rate is higher for women. Right. So it's glamorized. Somewhere we need to teach our kids that that is not okay. That's not sexy. There's right. nothing sexy yeah. about that. You know, in advertisements, they show that. And I wish I had them with me. I should have brought them. But they have some advertisements that really, like, really? Like, why? Does it show this message? Message are we sending to our little girls and little boys? Because a little boy looking at an advertisement where a man is well-dressed and there's a half-naked woman and he has his tie around her neck like a noose. Right. You know, he's looking at it like, oh, well, he looks powerful. He looks like he's in control. Right. Yeah. yeah. I have seen a bunch of ads, and I, I guess because I'm, I have my, um, I always have my filter on, and I'm always looking deep into some of these ads and stuff. And I'm like, so oh, yeah. the people making these ads don't see the bad part of that, but it's they know sex it's sells it's and violence sells. And this is exactly why it's not. I, I reject the notion that it's a woman's issue. It's not a woman's issue. You're right. It's, it's an issue. Health issue. Health it's issue. Yeah. It's an health issue. It becomes a health issue. issue. It yeah. actually really becomes a health issue. Yeah. So like I said, with the our kids, whether it's our girls and our boys, of course, have that conversation with them, that respect, boundaries, um, especially with technology now, with their cell phones. People, are, their boyfriends and girlfriends are tracking their every move. Yeah. They're tracking their yeah. every move you now. Know, you know, it's funny. Um, on TCE, we like to talk about um, having conversation. And um, I think, who am I again? The village, the village man. man. <laughs> so my thing is to have that conversation, and we have to have there's a structure that I think we all have here on TC, and we try to keep that structure. And it is good relationship within your um, your personal relationship and your family, and you have to have friends and you have to talk. And it's not about the crap out there. We're talking about these issues. We have to have that talk. And involve the children because guess what? It does involve the children. Yeah. So there are certain things, of course, you know what not to bring up and what you think might be out of the not. But that conversation needs to happen because you never know. Your child might say, you know, little Susie on the corner, that's exactly what's going on. I don't know that. And you're like, what? You're serious? You're just kidding. No. And, and, and it will come out. But if we're not comfortable speaking with our friends, family, children within our family, then these things will never come out. And it's easier for the predator to take charge of a person when they single them out. Right. Especially when you're kids in a way. Because yeah. I think yeah. about what you're saying um, with my daughter. She's off at college. And I, I, I know she's dating. Um, but it's, it's uncomfortable. So I, I kind of always ask her questions. I want to know how she's doing. So she didn't grow up in an environment where she saw abuse. Um, but it's still on the back of my mind. It, the people that come into her life, how are they treating her? I'm, you know, she's far away from me as a mom. So it's having that personal connection, that personal relationship, and always telling her, regardless if I think anything is happening or not, is I need to know what's going on in your life. At not, all times. not only that, Dawn, a lot of children, um, especially when they get to the, Jade's age, when they're 20, 22, 23, and they've not experienced abuse, so they don't even yeah. know what it looks yeah. like. You know, so so they don't even see it coming. Yeah. So even more reason for us to have these conversations with our children, whether they've experienced it or not. But I wanted to dial back what you said even one step further, even before I, I agree with you, it's important to talk to our friends, our family, our loved ones, but more even first and foremost is ourselves. It's like take care of ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically. This is how I know Sandra, um, because we take time out every Thursday and, and Saturday 
to invest in ourselves and, and, and work out. So we kind of have to make ourselves whole and right, you know, so I can be the best mommy to my children and the best partner to my partner, the best, the best person. And then you, you can't help, you have to put on your oxygen mask when the plane goes yeah. down before yeah. you can help nobody else. So if you're a hot mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So true. But it's yeah. definitely important to get that message out. I don't care if they're as young as 10 or right. as old as 22, just keep having that conversation with them. But be prepared, especially if they're young, you might hear something you don't want to hear, right? Yeah. If your 12-year-old daughter says, I'm having sex, be prepared. Because right. if you give a reaction where, what? And you're losing it, and, you beat, and you beat them, you just oh, shut yeah. that down. Uh, you, 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 you're talking about daughters. I also have a 12-year-old son. Yes. And I think it, 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 the, um, the same advice could be given to him, or advice is necessary for him right. in, the, in, in this life. Because... If he learned, because you know the whole boys don't cry thing and whatnot, because when when you repress those kind of emotions, then they have to have an outlet somewhere, mm -hmm. and I think that also leads into that's domestic actually violence one of the also. contribution towards domestic. That is actually a society societal contribution towards domestic violence. What mm -hmm. you said right there, gender roles. It's yeah. big. We tell our boys be strong. Yeah. Don't cry. Mm -hmm. Don't do this. And we tell our right. girls, oh, you gotta be submissive. You have to be cute. And so therefore, we put them in these roles. Mm -hmm. And then now expect, okay, they'll get this relationship together. Yeah, right, right. This, that, this you know, um, it, that was a great, great comment. Yeah? Um, and I think about the same thing. And, um, and what I have, what I have seen out there, is that um, this this sort of tribal way of I, the way I like to think of it, the link man is, it's our duty as men to make sure men know how to treat a woman. And why the women are important, and what you can learn from the women, and how the relationship could work. You know, it's it's. I, I think we've we've stepped away from from our duties, uh, so to speak. And I'm I'm a little bit sad about that. But I want to segue into something about uh, cultural role over the years and how everything changed. Because let's say, for instance, when we were growing up, we used to see in Humphrey Bogart and these guys. Frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. How? And everybody's like, ha ha, yeah. And we would sit in the movies and watch these being slapped. But at the same time, on the other side, we were very family oriented. I could go next door and get a stick of butter and go the other way and get some sugar and I would bring something else to somebody else. So we were tied in, so we did have that unit. But at the same time, there was a lot of subserviency in relationships where mommy stays home and daddy goes and he has a right to do this. And we see portrayed on movies. But the strategy now for the predator has changed because he could get away with it or she could get away with it or they could get away with it back then because it was something portrayed. But now there's a different method. Everybody's just, we would all be sitting here at dinner and everybody's on their electronics talking to someone else, and I see it very much with kids, that they could be in a room for the whole day and have an exchange of words. Mm -hmm. So now, the technique of divide and conquer, where you're just the only one, you can start the abuse over the internet by making some friends there and start to build that bond here. And it's happening right when you're sitting down watching movie next to someone who is on their tablet, phone, or whatsoever. And then it develops because we're not that much connected, which is why TC and the village man is saying, let's always have that conversation. Let's always talk. If you haven't seen anybody in a while, there's absolutely no reason why you can't call and say, hey, how you doing? I'm in your area. Just want to pass by. Just want to say hi. Rather than, you know what? I don't want to get involved with nobody. You know? This is becoming too much. I so you yeah. restore that kind of <laughs> yes, communal that, relationship. Yes, because the divide and conquer is there now as an opportunity. Those are the cracks that a predator mm -hmm. can go through and see that and use it. Yeah. I think we all have that communal responsibility. You yeah. know, I like that you said that with the men stepping forward. But I believe that women need to step awesome. forward as well because I'll tell you a story years ago before I even started working in women in distress years ago I was someplace and I saw the same thing but this time I saw the woman hitting the man so she's beating him and she's highly upset she's crying she's screaming but she's slapping him and she's scratching him with his face 
And this poor man is doing everything he can to get her to stop. He keeps putting her hands down. He keeps telling her stop. He's done. And I walked by and did nothing. I remember thinking, I wonder what he did, right? Mm -hmm. He probably cheated on her son. And I kept it moving. But you better believe if the tables were turned, I would never have walked away. Mm -hmm. I would have called the cops. Yeah. So we all have a communal responsibility that whether it's a woman putting their hand on a man or a man putting their hand on a woman or women and women, it, we right, have that's, okay. that's our responsibility. It's not okay. We have to teach it that it's not okay because for some reason, women think that when I do it, it's okay. And it's, it's not. not. It's not. So uh -huh. I have a question uh -huh. too. Uh -huh. like, I know you guys are following something, but okay. So, um, like listening to everything, and um, I want I want to put a, a little different perspective on, on our thought process. We're we're talking about the, the 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 person being abused. So, you know, I, I think of myself. If I could go back and say to my dad who was the abuser, why did you do this, daddy? Why did you treat people so poorly? Why don't you get help? Mm -hmm. uh, what message would you give to the actual person that is doing this? You've seen all the, all, all the mm -hmm. hurt and pain that comes from the person that's on the receiving end, but what message can we put out there to someone that might be watching, not necessarily tonight or once this, this is shared, what message would you say to that person? Like, get help, you know. Definitely, definitely get the help that you need. There are batterers programs out there. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research on how successful they are. With women in distress, we only work with the victims. We do not even have any type of service for the batterer, just out of safety for the victims. Right. So, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of information when it comes to batterers, but I know there are batterers programs out there to help them but I'm just not quite sure how successful they are. Um, a lot of people think batterers are because they drink. They may have a drinking problem, substance abuse problem. That's not the cause of it. Um, some people think it's an anger management situation. That's not the cause of it either. Most people that do that are very, sometimes they're very charming people. Extremely. Oh, yeah. right? uh, yeah. They're the kind of yeah. people where them, they would chop up their wife and bury them in the backyard. Yeah. And the neighbors would be like, never. I would never. never think. Exactly. He is so sweet or exactly. she is so sweet. So somebody yeah. with anger management yeah. problems, they want to beat up everybody, right? They're upset right. with everybody. Where them, they're very charming and behind closed doors is when it happens. So it's very intentional. So I would say to the better, just definitely try to find the help. Um, that you can, but I think my focus has always been more on the survivor, right. you know, yeah. to get them well, the help and get out because for too long they are being blamed for I'm, being there. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up about the um, that it's, it's not just a woman victim, it's, it's also there's a, it's a male victim um, component to this, also. Because, so, with saying that, I can give you an anecdotal experience from myself. I remember as me. I think I was my um, my son's age at the time. I thought I was about 12, 13. And I went to a school that they, um, I remember the experience vividly. And this went on for a while. There was a girl there that she was, she was stocky. Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't fat. She was stocky. Big girl. And I wasn't the biggest kid, right? So she was a, a little bit bigger than me, but she's you know, still a girl. I still, you know, I, I, I didn't feel intimidated. What intimidated me, and this goes back to the boys up for everything, this, this is what, what kind of terrified me every day is because my father always drilled into my head, you don't hit women, you don't do this, you, you, you don't, there, there's no circumstances where you touch a woman, right? But I got threatened by her every single day, every single day, and got assaulted by her. But with, okay, so with words and with, and with, with yeah, physical um, and verbal. No, I know. I'm sure she's going to be a fine person now. Well, but but, but, okay, but, right? but, <laughs> but okay, this, this was my experience yeah. then, yeah. right? So yeah, this is this is these are you saying these kinds of lessons need to be learned by males and females. Of course, the same way your dad was saying, "Don't yeah. put your hand on a woman." Somebody should have been telling her, "You don't put your hands on her." Yeah, it was it was it was traumatic. Yeah. Not because I didn't feel I could defend myself. Like crazy. Right, no, but with words, this is where you get witty with words. Because I I went to all girls school and them girls never around to pick on me. So I got I got smart with my mouth. So and then 
hired bodyguards and all that. <laughs> <laughs> you do what you gotta do. So Natalie so, wants to um, okay. also, sorry Shauna, keep up the great work, stop the abuse, me to women's rights. Yes. So we actually need to wrap it up. So just so you know, Sandra, the way we usually wrap up our shows is um, we'll go, we'll do round table, what you would like, um, your biggest message. Um, you can have one or two of your special guests, but usually what is the message out of this particular episode that you want people um, to, to hear? So we'll, we'll save you for last. Okay. So, um, Boy, I always get to that. I was just that <laughs> first. But that's all right. That's all right. Um, one of the things that, that I got personally from it, besides the demographics that you gave out that blew my mind was um, some of the techniques and how what we would consider if we were just an uh, uneducated person sitting on a corner, we would consider, no, we have to go in and take control of the situation, you know, big man things, boss, big man things, I mean, you can't do that to the sister. Maybe, I then when we see the, the guy getting abused, we're like, yo, boss, you need to take care of your business, you know, how come you make the girl do it? So we would actually put a little bit more pressure on the whole situation. We've learned now that sometimes you have, to, you have to be very practical and don't, well, I wouldn't say don't get involved, but it's better to be fully um, educated on the situation and how to properly handle the situation. So I, I really got a lot from this and I really thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with us today. Um, I too want to say thank you so much for being here. Um, I think the information that was shared was very um, useful and helpful. But for me, if we could even out of this episode help at least just, even if it's one person, my humble opinion, it would be a great success. So um, Sandra, you shared with us earlier a hotline number, a local hotline number, as well as a national hot, hotline number. So we will post that in the comments of this episode. But I would just like to ask you guys, um, you know, I, it's our show, so I think it's all important. But I would raise this one to the, to the top of the priority list as far as information to get out to everybody. Because like Sandra said, abuse, you, you, it looks like all of us sitting here. It doesn't matter your education level. It doesn't matter your financial status. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your sexual orientation or religion. It exists in every single community. So um, you think you know, but you don't know. So please do share this episode and get the word out so we can ha help each other. Okay. And before I, I give my closing statement, um, Trisha uh, Chung Foster, thanks for joining us, made a comment. Thanks for all you do, Sandra. Our audience is thanking you as well. And for all the information that you provided and great show TCE crew. Big up, Trisha. Um, <laughs> so for me personally, it, it's difficult sitting here listening to it because it rehashes so much for me on a personal level. Um, but... I, I definitely will be donating more based on this talk, um, trying to help more, trying to get more information to educate us as a, as a team, as well as every person we can touch. We know it's a very hidden subject, not discussed, especially in the Caribbean community. So anything that our viewers see that we can do to help definitely let us know most of you um, know all of us or can find a way to contact us because we definitely want to continue to support you in such a well-needed um, situation for people that are out there that are, are that need help again thank you sandra so much for um, for joining us i personally I, and i think i speak for everyone else but i learned quite a bit from the discussion, the discussion we had off there and the discussion we had here quite a bit. So thank you for sharing your time and what you guys at Women in Distress do. You know, the, the guys do an awesome job. Yeah. And yeah, I'm gonna be donating quite a bit. <laughs> but um, I, also, I also wanted to, um, as far as what I would, what any advice for what it's worth, what I would say, just everyone just look at the kind of norms that we take for granted because some of these norms or cultural norms can be destructive. And if, if sometimes you know you look far from us, you, you don't realize what's happening. 
you know, but if you just take a step back and realize what, what are you fostering in, in your kids, because it starts from there, you know, what you're fostering, because if you're, if it's patriarchal, then, you know, you know what's, what, what's happening, you're, you're creating a, a, a hierarchy that's, that's not necessarily healthy, and there's backlash to that too, because it could build up resentment in your daughter, right, so, you know, just pay attention to the norms that we, that we take for granted, and maybe we can put a dent in what was that again? 50% of the homeless. 57. 57. Don't forget the 7. The 7 is 7. Yeah. Come get you. It's striking. You, t- yeah. you, you touch on such a great point because it starts with us in breaking whatever cycles. I think we all mentioned that. Breaking the cycles that we experience so our children, our grandchildren yeah. don't go through that. Cutting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, <laughs> my biggest takeaway I would like everybody to take away with is um, just how to help somebody. So I don't, I'm not sure if I made it very clear. So number one, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions respectfully. You know, are you afraid of your partner? You know, um, does your partner control a lot of what you do? Does the, your partner um, control how long you're out or in the house? Um, ask those questions if you start to see. If you have a group, where did you get that? What happened? How often does he hit you? How often does she hit you? Ask the questions. Because what happens, sometimes we see it and we say nothing, right? Because it's almost uncomfortable for us to even ask it. But again, that's part of our communal responsibility. Ask questions respectfully. Don't ask, why don't you just leave? We will take that out completely. Never ask that. Um, Again, it's victim blaming and it's another person telling them what to do. Um, Two, validate. Tell them you believe them. A lot of times people, no, not Johnny, there's no way he does that. No, not Sarah, no way, she's, you know. Validate, tell them you believe them. And the, another good question is, how do you want me to help you? How do you want me to help you? You put the power back to them. Right. You give it back to them. Because they may not be ready to leave. Right. But they may say, I just need a friend to talk to yeah. until right. I feel strong enough to go. Right. I might need to leave some stuff at your house. Right. So that way, if I have to run with the kids, I have somewhere to go. I should be able to say, well, maybe I can call you. You can come pick me up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know. But you already let your wife and everybody know that you're just picking me up because I'm, I'm all of a sudden, I don't feel safe anymore, yeah, right. you know. So just try to find out what that is that they need. Right, okay? right. Definitely refer. Um, a lot of times you can put yourself at risk. And we don't want more danger, mm-hmm. you know. So you can put yourself at risk again. Could refer to women in distress in Broward County. There are other um, shelters and service centers in Day County and Palm Beach, but Broward County is women in distress. What's your number? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't want to forget. What's okay. the number? The actual hotline number is 954 761 1133. Again, that's 954 761 1133. Refer them to that number. That'll get them to at least the place where they need to go. But definitely be that support. You know, ask questions. Try to be at least supportive. Because just know that there's the average time that they leave and come back is seven times. Wow. Yeah, the average time. Seven. Average amount. Yeah, it's not set in stone, but that's the average amount. They will leave, go back, leave. So you have to be a really patient friend. Right. right? Yeah. right. That takes a really patient person right. to say, okay, I know that she left, but she may go back. And she may go back. She doesn't want to destroy her family. She doesn't want to lose her kids. She may not have papers. She might be undocumented, and that's what's helping her. She may be homeless. He might, you know, depend on this person for medical bills. So know that all these factors play a big role. Right. So they're going to need you to be, like, very supportive and very patient. That fact alone is worth another hour. Yeah. 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 I know. There's a lot. I'm sorry. So, yeah. no, so again, thank you on behalf of the Caribbean Edge. Thank you so thank much you. for being here. Thank it you was a me. pleasure and honor to have you. This was very informative. Um, so, guys, we will see you next week. Remember, well, thank you, first of all, for signing in to another episode of The Caribbean Edge. Edge. We'll see you next week. Remember to like, subscribe, share, follow us on <laughs> Facebook, the crap YouTube, Twitter. <laughs> we'll see you next Oh, no, we're not here next week. It's, it's Thanksgiving. We're going away, right? Yeah, oh, we're doing yeah. something special. Yeah. <laughs> we are. We did. We are. <laughs> Uh, All right. We are. All We're right. doing something special. Stay right. tuned. We'll see you when we see you. I'll Skype in. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Boy, I want to, when I zoom.